Welcome back once again, this is Victor Magariño, and today we're looking at a video by this online platform slash uh, YouTube channel called Learn Liberty, where they teach you how to misinterpret the classical economists, and they defend to the very death your freedom and your liberty to use strawman arguments against some of the strongest and most common sense arguments put forth by some of the most brilliant minds in the history of economics. The particular issue that we're going to be looking at today was brought up by this uh, Learn Liberty YouTube channel in 2011 with professor from George Mason University, Don Boudreau, where they speak about subjective value theory and they pretend as if what they are saying in that video somehow disproves the theory of value held by the classical economists before the marginalist revolution in 1871. So let him speak for himself. One of the most crucial insights of economics is that value is subjective. It means value ultimately comes from the human mind. It really? Now, of course, that might be the case if by value you define, well, value to be uh, your particular preference of a determined good or service. But if you define value as something else, you might find that you are actually wrong. So it depends on, on how you define value. But this is one of the most profound insights of economics, really, that everyone has their own valuation of things. I mean, isn't that completely obvious? Now, of course, that is completely obvious for anyone that lives in the real world. But I mean, why would he need to say this? And the reason for this is that he's later on going to try to say that this somehow disproves, this obvious fact somehow disproves the labor theory of value, even though it actually does not disprove it, as we will see. However, what he's going to try to do here, he's going to present uh, an example, and he's going to bring about two t-shirts, one with a Che Guevara uh, face on the, on, on the front, and another one with a Milton Friedman face on the front, and let's see what conclusions he's going to extract from this. Now, these t-shirts uh, both cost me about the same amount of time to make the same amount of money. So in terms of what I spent, the resources that went into these t-shirts, it's the same. But you know what? The value of the Che t-shirt is, in fact, a lot higher to most people than is the value of the Milton Friedman t-shirt. If for some reason Che falls out of favor in the public mind, the value of the Che t-shirt falls. If the value of Milton Friedman's image rises. If people come to really like Milton Friedman, the value of the Friedman t-shirt increases. So this is again also relative to how you define value. If you define value as simply use value, how much people want something, then it is in fact the case that if people like something more, then that thing becomes more valuable. If you define value as being just the market price of the commodity, then if supply stays constant and demand increases more rapidly in a given sector, then it is in fact the case that you expect prices in that sector to go up. And if demand lowers uh, relative to supply, then you can also expect prices to go down. But if you define value as those things, you can in fact say that well, things become more or less valuable. But if you define value to be something else, which is what the classicals are going to do, then you might find that, in fact, value stays the same. So, I mean, this absolute, he's trying, again, to present this single notion of value that I'm going to argue is single-minded, and he's just going to say, oh, look, this disproves the theory. No, if we play with the rules of the classical economists, for example, let's say, for them, uh, well, I mean, there's differences, but uh, in the basic Ricardian uh, conception of value is relative vertical integrated labor times. And if there is mobility across sectors and people understand what's happening in different sectors, well, by this meaning that there is mobility, then what you can expect is that if it takes the same amount of time, if it costs the same to produce the two shirts, that their relative uh, labor times will not differ, they, they will still be the same, and thus their relative prices will not differ independently of uh, whether some people suddenly value this thing more or less. If there is competition and there is mobility across sectors, then you can expect value to remain the same if you define value to be 
relative labor times. And you see how relative labor times bring about a given natural price. I'm going to explain this difference and we're going to look at this data uh, a little bit more closely uh, next. But for now, let's just keep in mind that what he's trying to do already doesn't lead us to somewhere that some a proper academic scholar that is actually trying to teach you something will lead you. This is going on, on a different path. This is a nice thing about subjective value. Our values do differ. Uh, I would not be caught on the street wearing a Che t-shirt because I think he was a scoundrel. Right? I would love to wear a Milton Friedman t-shirt. In fact, I'm eager to wear this for the first time. I value this t-shirt more highly than do other people. And that's one of the beautiful things about understanding subjective value. <laughs> I mean, this is just so, so ridiculous. I mean, he's just saying something that is so obvious that he likes something more than another thing. And he's just there saying this, pretending that this somehow is going to disprove anything said by Adam Smith or by David Ricardo or by Marx on value. I mean, this is just laughable, directly laughable. It's important to understand that the value is not in the thing itself. It doesn't come like the Marxists believed or even the classical economists believe from the amount of labor that goes into producing it. Value is not a product of how many other resources went into producing something. Ultimately, things have value only if and only because human beings want those things. Now here is where the big problem that makes me question this guy's academic integrity comes into question because he is going to lie with without any sort of shame about what the classicals thought use value was. I mean, they, uh, Marx at least, had this differential between, had this definition of value as something that manifested in two different ways one which was exchange value another one which was use value and he was specifically clear and in in the classical tradition pretty much all other economists were also clear about this that commodities before they have any exchange value people must want to purchase and to consume those commodities this is in no sense a criticism of the classical theory of value because it is assumed when you're dealing with commodities that they have used value and in fact that is how commodity is defined is defined as an object that has value but also has an exchange value because commodities when well, when exchange is generalized are not produced just to be consumed but for exchange and now other laws play uh, other laws come into play and now you have to look at other patterns and you have to understand different conceptions of value that emerge from capitalist societies themselves. And this is why these economists were not so simplistic as to just limit themselves to, oh, people like things, therefore, that's it. That's it. We don't need to explain anything more. We just need to look, people like things, good, okay, that's it. No, it's not. It's not. Life is more complicated than this. And Marx, and, and we're going to look at this, Marx made it very clear that an object must be useful. And furthermore, use value does in fact emerge from the material, the physical uh, properties, or from the social mental properties of uh, a given commodity. It's not just that... Um, value exists in people's mind but it also is not independent from the physical aspect from the size from 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 the from the components that bring about a given commodity value is, use value is not independent because for example this bottle is valuable for me because of the shape it has because it i can drink from it if it didn't uh, well if it didn't perform this simple task of being able to pour water on it so that I can drink it, then this would have no use for me. But it has use precisely because of the physical component of it. But this is if we only focus on use value. Exchange value is a different property that has other laws. 
to illustrate this point about how the classicals actually did believe that things had use value and that in fact use value was independent from the amount of labor that it took to produce those things, let's look at a quote from Marx, volume 1, section 1, chapter 1, in literally the first page of Das Kapital. Let's look at it. So let's see what he says. A commodity is, in the first place, an object outside us, a thing that by its properties satisfies human wants of some sort of or another. The utility of a thing makes it a use value, but this utility is not a thing of air. Being limited by the physical properties of the commodity, it has no existence apart from that commodity. A commodity such as iron, corn, or a diamond is therefore, so far as it is a material thing, a use value, something useful. This property of a commodity is independent of the amount of labor required to appropriate its useful qualities. So this is it. It doesn't get any more simple than this. And this guy, Jet, is going to come and say that the classicals didn't see this as a thing, that the classicals thought that people value things objectively and that the, the commodity sort of speaks of, of for itself and people just accept the value and commodities dictate their own value. The, I mean, again, this is poor scholarship because this is exactly in the first page of Das Kapital. It doesn't get any more simple than this. And furthermore, exchange value, which can be roughly defined as the price of a commodity or better defined as the proportion to which you can exchange that commodity for another commodity, exchange value is also different from value. But value is going to be the center of gravitation of exchange value, of the proportion through which commodities against, uh, exchange against one another. This is the key insight of value, that value is something uh, f for the Marxist and the classical tradition, which is roughly, and again, there's differences because Marx, con Marx's conception of value is that of abstract, socially necessary labor time. But if you take value to be that, and you look at the data on this and you see the movements of exchange values, you can see how they are regulated by something. And that something we're going to argue is value, which is different from exchange value, which itself is different from use value, even though they all coexist in the same commodity. So this is why you need to not be so simplistic as to just say use value. Use value determines the price of things because it doesn't. It, it under very specific circumstances it does but when you're speaking about syst uh, about worldwide capitalist economies other laws come into play and you need to understand the inner patterns you need to understand what are the regulating mechanisms of these social laws it's not they are not individual once you get to the whole of society they become social and these laws are impersonal they work regardless of what you personally think about them. So we must be clear here that there's these distinctions that this 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 economics professor is absolutely abstracting from. He's not, not, not only abstracting for analytical purposes, but because he probably doesn't even understand that there's this distinction in the in the Marxist tradition between these four different forms of value. And he's just going to come here and say, well, my definition of value is the correct one and he's not even going to define properly what the classicals used as value he's not going to present any data or anything he's just going to present obvious things as if they somehow meant that the classicals were wrong and this is again so simplistic this is i, I mean it's pure ideology it's pure propaganda so now let's look more in depth at the basic logic of the classical argument with respect to value and the empirical evidence that suggests that the classicals were actually right about what they took value to be. And let me explain here that I'm going to be more detailed about the, this uh, process of explaining all of this uh, in my series on the classical political economy. But for now, I'm just going to give a rough summary of, of what this is. And this is very uh, a good opportunity because the example that he gives of the t-shirts is going to help us illustrate this point. 
So the t-shirts he presents us are pretty much the same and as he states, we pretty much could say that they cost the same amount of labor time to be manufactured. So according to Ricardo and, and Smith, we, we are here going to put a simple uh, scenario where there's no class division, there's just producers who get the income that they receive, but you could do this also with dividing uh, producers and the ones that own the means of production, but for now, we're just going to do the simple case. And here we are, uh, we have two producers, one that produced Che Guevara shirts and the other one that produced uh, Milton Friedman t-shirts. And let's imagine that these two producers produce one t-shirt an hour and that they sell that t-shirt for $10 so that their income per hour is 10. Now, what the classicals are going to say about this, and Marx is going to accept it, is that essentially the ratio of the labor times is going to tend to be equal, or is going to be pretty much equal, to the ratio of their prices, of the natural prices, which are the prices that give you equal profit rates. And we're going to look at the mechanism for this. So one is going to be the ratio because it's going to be one hour for one t-shirt and one hour for one t-shirt. So it's going to be one over one, which is one is going to be the ratio of the of the uh, direct and indirect labor times. And you're going to have one to be also the ratio of the prices. Now let's examine what would happen if in the Che Guevara uh, sector, for example, price was 12. Now, as you can find in the, if this were the case, in the Che Guevara sector, the income per hour would be higher because now each t-shirt each is going to be sold at 12, which is higher than 10. But if the labor times are the same and there's competition across sectors and there's mobility between these sectors, what the Marxists and the classicals were going to say is that you expect there to be an increase in the supply relative to demand of the Che Guevara sector because you know, producers in the Milton Friedman sector are not going to be stupid and they're going to see that they are receiving higher incomes for the same amount of labor time in the Che Guevara uh, 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 sector. And so they're going to move more rapidly, not all of them. This is not about uh, maximizing anything. This is not individual rationality or anything. There's going to be a tendency for producers to outgrow demand in that sector of the Che Guevara t-shirts, which will, using the simple uh, demand and supply model, is going to bring the price down again to the price that brings about uh, the, the same equal incomes per hour, which is going to be, in this case, 10. Now, so far, so long as the, the ratio between these two is 1, so they have the same incomes per hour, then what you can expect is precisely this. And, and, and this is the, the logic, basically, is that labor times are going to regulate natural prices and natural prices are going to regulate market prices, precisely because what we are assuming here is capitalism. We're not looking at, at this um, single exchange between two individuals and, and pretending as if this could be generalized to the entire whole of society. We're looking at actually the patterns that emerge from competition and we are going to extract from them the basic logic. And we're also going to look at the data on this. So how can we prove the labor theory of value to be right? And for this, we need to essentially look at what are the implications, what are the predictions of the theory and whether or not the data proves them right or proves them wrong. So. What are these implications? Well, first, as we said, the first thing that Ricardo and Adam Smith already said is that relative natural prices, which are, again, the prices, natural prices are not the same as market prices. Natural prices are the prices that give you equal incomes per hour or equal profit rates. And these natural prices are going to be equal or very similar they're the difference between them and vertically integrated, which are direct and indirect, uh, relative labor times, this difference is going to be very small. And it's also going to suggest that these market prices, because they're regulated by the natural prices, are also going to be very similar to natural prices. So we have already this prediction. Now, let's look at the data that we have on given 
to us by input output tables in order to see whether or not these predictions are actually right. So in this study by economist Anwar Shaikh on the empirical strength of the labor theory of value, we find the data that Anwar Shaikh gives us uh, taken from input output tables on these specific values. And we can here see quite clearly how uh, looking at the mean average weighted deviation, which is something that uh, we're also going to look when we look at this more particularly in our uh, think rethinking classical uh, economics video series. But, but for now, let's just see that this is the, the mean deviation between these values that we're looking at. And it's also weighted so that you account for uh, different uh, well, some industries might be um, more important than others and so on, so that you uh, eliminate these differences. And we're looking at this data for the United States across different years. And the findings are the following. First, that the difference, the mean average weighted difference between labor values and market prices across these years is very small. And the average is 0 0.092. This is very small differences, exactly as the labor theory of value predicts. But this is not the only thing, because the prices of production, which are natural prices, versus the market price, are also very similar, and the, in the differential is even smaller. And labor values versus the prices of production, which again are the natural prices, and this is specifically Ricardo's contention, the average is 0 0.044 in the same economy across different years. So this is something that, again, is proven by data. And this is not the only study that we have on this. There are studies that show this in different countries, like this one, or this one, or this other one. So not only did the classicals not think that use value didn't exist, specifically Marx, but actually they went a further step and they saw what were the underlying tendencies that spring from competition, that spring from markets, and that capitalism produces. And at the time, they weren't able to prove this because the data for these, uh, well, for these variables didn't exist. But today, we can because we have input-output tables that every country publishes, and we can, in fact, show this to be right. The classical economists for all of their wonderful discoveries, did not get subjective value. Economists didn't understand subjective value until the middle of the 19th century, when particularly Karl Menger of the Austrian school realized that people pay for things only because they want those things. They don't pay for things that they don't want. Here, he's actually wrong once again, because subjective value theory doesn't just suddenly appear in the, eight, in the 19th century with Karl Menger. It actually has its roots in the 16th and in the 17th century with actually a Spanish uh, theologian, Juan de Mariana. This theory was already known before Marx even. And in fact, the classicals uh, were aware of the fact that there were people trying to explain uh, value through use value. And in fact, they found it so laughable and it's in fact so simplistic and so incoherent just to look at one aspect of value and ignore everything else it because of ideological purposes. That's obviously the case. And they found this so laughable that they didn't even think that anyone could possibly say that value is just about, well, I subjectively like this more. No, it's not. Once again, once society comes into the, the picture, there's certain loss and people still value things and commodities still need to be used values before they become commodities. But then other things come into play. And again, the classicals already knew that there were certain people trying to put this um, more subjectivist theory, even though they weren't aware that after they would die, like what happened with Marx, uh, people would actually turn this into the economic orthodoxy because they, they legitimately thought that this was so simplistic that it, it, it just didn't have any bearing whatsoever into important scientific economic thought. One implication of subjective value is that you can't tell me that 
the fact that I prefer the Milton Friedman t-shirt to the Che Guevara t-shirt means that I'm wrong. I mean, this is just ridiculous. I, I imagine him in his bed being very afraid of Marx coming to him and saying, oh, you're wrong because you like Milton Friedman more than Che Guevara. This is simply ridiculous. Who in the history of economics, or at least in the in the history of economics that supported the labor theory of value, suggested that those that like Milton Friedman shirts more are wrong than, or at least are more wrong than those that like Che Guevara shirts. This is, this is just, Again, a, a, an even deeper version of the Strawman argument. Or if he's not attempting to present this as a criticism of the labor theory of value, I would actually like to know why even say it there. It's so obvious that because you like something, you're not necessarily wrong. Just why? Like, why? Why? It's not your preference, perhaps, but it's my preference. And because you can't read my mind and I can't read your mind, the best you can do is say, well... If I prefer the Friedman t-shirt to the Guevara t-shirt, then, in fact, the Friedman t-shirt, to me, is more valuable. Okay, okay, we got that point the first time you said it. No one cares that you like Milton Friedman t-shirts more than Che Guevara t-shirts, okay? No one cares. We just don't care. We want you to explain to us why the labor theory of value is wrong, and you haven't done this. So we have come to the end of this video, and to conclude it, I just want you to... Really close your eyes and sit there and think for a second that there's people with PhDs in economics out there that legitimately think that the fact that they like Milton Friedman t-shirts more than Che Guevara t-shirt disproves the theory of value of the classical economists and that the fact that people have different well preferences means that the classicals were wrong. This is literally like a PhD in biology saying out loud that because monkeys don't give birth to human beings that the theory of evolution is wrong. So this is it for now. I hope you like this video. You can support me by liking, by subscribing and so on. And well, I will see you in the next video.